Mr. Rishian Huang. Uh, he is not only an international and sought after concert artist, but he's also the winner of the Los Angeles Internationalist Competition that we held on the campus of uh, Azusa Pacific University where we are today. And he's also a successful music entrepreneur and he's a doctoral candidate at the University of Southern California Thornton School of Music. He, the music will speak for itself, of course, and uh, the topic of uh, today's class is Franz Liszt and his um, arrangements, piano arrangements uh, of various works. And uh, please give a warm applause to Mr. Wang. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Dr. Porger for your warm invitation, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I know it's a uh, Valentine's Day, so I'll try to finish this as quick as possible so you guys can have fun <laughs> after this. All right, so speaking of Liszt, you know, I wasn't his big fan at the beginning, probably just like some of you, when you just started learning his music. I'm like, why there are so many notes, right? <laughs> why so difficult? Why can't he just roll something easier? But then, the more I get to know him, my attitude can change. Especially about three, four years ago, I attended a lecture at Julia during the piano forum, exactly like the events today. And the host is Alan Walker. Of course, this is not the DJ Alan Walker. So Alan Walker is a, <laughs> one of the greatest scholars of Liszt, and he also wrote many books for Liszt, Chopin and Schumann. And I highly, actually highly recommend his uh, books. Here is the, some of the books he wrote. It's very interesting. And then he reveals some of the life and people don't usually know. So after reading his book and then get to know more Liszt, I realized Liszt is actually not the Liszt we originally think of, you know? The image kind of gives us a wrong impression Liszt is, might be a bad guy. The background is always dark and then he wrote Fall Symphony or Mephisto Wars. So we might think the list has something to do with evil, right? Probably sold his soul to the devil. <laughs> so uh, the list actually is very kind and generous guy. He himself not only uh, being a great pianist and composer, but only not only that he, at the end of his life, he desired to be a priest, and he studied the Holy Bible very profoundly, and he wrote a lot of uh, religious music, which you probably never heard of it. I recommend you go listen to his end of the music, uh, end of his life, the music he wrote. It's very different than the beginning of the year and uh, the middle life. And now, the other thing, Liszt is doing great as, as an educator. It's crazy that I think about how he can manage his time, besides touring the Euro, right? Performing a lot and com doing composition. Then he's also educate many great pianists. Those names are very well known, such as Hans von Hulo, Arthur Feinheim, Morris Rosenthal. Those are great pianists. And they themselves later become a great teacher too. So nowadays, if you go to a concert, you see some pianist biography. They may write something like, I am the third generation or fourth generation of Liszt. And it might sound funny, but actually that's the truth. The fact is, Liszt has a uh, in multiple impact on the later pianists and he himself and his student later also cultivate many great pianists. So you might find out you have some sort of relationship with Liszt. And Liszt is a student of Czerny and Czerny was a student of Beethoven. So we really can trace this back to Beethoven. Actually that's amazing, right? Think about Liszt, it's not actually too far from maybe just third or fourth generation away from us. So today's topic, we're going to talk about the lesser known side of Liszt. As I said, Liszt not only as a composer, pianist, educator, and he also transcribed and added other composers' work. You know, he wrote a completely Beethoven, uh, complete Beethoven symphony, transcribed all of them. And there's many operas he that transcribed and also the paraphrase. So before we get into the specific work, we need to understand what is transcription and what is paraphrase. 
These are very similar terms, but they are not exactly the same. Transcription means the you just pre, uh, basically take whatever the original word is and transfer it to the piano. So it's very straightforward, more or less straightforward to the original. On the other hand, paraphrase is that you take the idea or some excerpt or even a motive and then later add your own thoughts, your own idea to make a completely different work. But still you can hear some motives, uh, ideas from the original work. So the paraphrase is something more personal, something more subjective. Okay, so less distant than the original work. Um, the first work we are going to talk is the Pagni Etudes. But before we get into that, there's also a historical context behind why Liszt doing so many transcriptions. Because first of all, Liszt lived in 18, so 19th century. He was born in 1811, uh, right? So at that time, the travel was not convenient as now on, nowadays. We don't have airplanes, we don't have trains, we don't have Tesla, right? At that time. So people can really travel to the center of the Europe if they are not from Vienna or London. So how can they listen, hear the newest opera or symphony? And this serves as an ambassador. He basically, every time he toured to other cities, besides playing his own music, he would bring the transcription of the newest opera or symphony that introduced to the European audience. I think that's a great thing that he do. And also the sound recording did ex not exist yet. So for people nowadays, you go to Spotify, Apple, or YouTube, you can hear the newest things, you know, whatever the music style is. But at that time, without those sound recordings, you might never get to hear those uh, symphonies or operas. So Liszt actually bring, people get to know Liszt, get to know, hear Liszt new transcription before hear the original work. That might be the, mostly the case back then. Also, the development of instrument and piano technique. We know that before Liszt, the piano wasn't like this in the modern form, right? It's mostly forte piano. There are not 88 keys, and the keys are more fragile. So you can't really play uh, on those instruments, like big words such as Liszt Dante Sonata or B minor Sonata. You might broke the entire instrument. So thanks to the European Industrial Revolution, happened around 1820 to 1840, that helped the piano become the form close to the modern form so that this can actually create a symphonic pieces, a symphonic or, uh, sonority. And this was the one able to play them. You know, nowadays, a lot of composers, they write hard music, but they can't really play it. And they have to ask for the pianist to play it. But this is the one, he can play everything. And he can easily play his own work. So the technique he has was almost on parallel level. That's why he had, can write the entire Beethoven symphony on the piano. Think about it. If you just look at the Beethoven Symphony original score and ask you to play every voice on the piano, that's hard thing to do. I, I don't know how many people can actually do it, but Liz was able to transcribe all the Beethoven Symphony on the piano. So I just think about how insane he can do these things. And the last thing is the innovation in the concert media. Nowadays, you know, people play the concert this way. But this actually innovates by list. He's the first one to position himself, face the audience. Before that, the concert mostly is like this. We see some pianists and conduct the Mozart concerto. That's the format used to be. But this is the first one positioning himself, face the audience. So we hear some story that whenever he go, he was always surrounded by the noble women. And women will throw up the rings gifts, flowers, and they will scream and cry after listening to it. Just like Michael Jackson, that kind of things back then. So this is, in a way, so many things. And he was the first one ever memorized the music in the concert. And thanks to this, that gave us so many stage fright. We have to memorize the music right now. Okay, so the first piece we're going to focus on today is the Grandes Etudes de we know Paganini is the, one of the greatest violinists. The man elevates the technique to unparalleled level. So after listening Paganini in Paris in 1828, Liszt won himself to be a Paganini on piano. So he wrote uh, the series of Paganini etudes, 
mostly from the Paganini 24 Caprices. And there are two versions. First version was composed in 1838. And then the second edition, later this revised in 1851. So what is doing that? Because the first version was so hard. I don't know how many people actually heard the first version. Now matter, actually, the second version is already hard enough, but compared to the first edition, it's nothing. And not only just the Paganini etudes, for the transcendental etudes, this also wrote two versions. So let me just give you a quick taste of what the comparison between the second version and the first version. So you know why this revised it. Okay, here is the second edition, okay, of the list uh, Paganini etudes, number four. We also have a name for it, it's called arpeggios. <laughs> It's written in one line because it's one uh, imitating the violin technique and the violin score. So there's only one line. And now, let's take a look at the second. Actually, the first, this is the first version, which is the original version. two pianists can play it back then. And this work dedicated to another great pianist, Carl Schumann. So this piece and the other, along with other five etudes, become the Paganini etudes, the six pieces. Uh, almost every of them has a name. The first one is called Fraglio, second one without a name. The third one is a very famous piece, La Capulena. The literal translation is the bow, right? And then the fourth one, which is played, has a nickname on it, uh, Apeggio. The fifth one is called La Chaise. And the last one is the theme and variation. So probably the most two famous one are the number three and number six. And the reason for them to become famous is not only, uh, you know, it's more played right now, but also because of other platform. You know, a lot of pop music and music uh, for the movie insert the La Campolena in some <laughs> moment. And also the number six, which is the theme of variation. Liszt, Brahms, Rachmaninoff, and so many other composers took that theme, made their own work. Even the modern composer like Lutoslavsky, I'm sure you heard some of them work, right? So that makes these two specifically become famous in the piano history. So I guess my job today is not only just go through the pieces with you, I also I'm here to play some music for you. So. Now I'm going to do the number three and number six for you. For the sake of time, we'll just do the two etudes today.
<laughs> okay. So the next character we're going to introduce is Don Huang. The reason I'm introduced Don Huang is because of the paraphrase. Another great work by List. It's called Reminiscence with Don Huang. This is a paraphrase work because Don Huang and List is not in, uh, excerpt, only excerpt only three arias from Mozart's opera, not such translated characters. Uh, Don Huang, we know, is a fictional character, and he is using his test names to seduce a lot of noble women, and, uh, which is written in Mozart's opera, Don Giovanni. This opera was premiered in 1787. The plot was Don Juan seduced a noble girl, Donna Anna, and murdered her father, Gonzalo. And later, the Don Juan met a statue in a cemetery. And then the statue asked to shake hands, and then Don Juan was dragged to the hell. And the plot fresh here. There's one version that Don Juan prayed to God for forgiveness, and he was redeemed. And the second version was Don Juan refused. Uh, the guy refused to save Don Juan, and Don Juan fell into the hell. So what List doing with this piece is that List take three different parts from the opera and insert to his work at his own imagination, of course, a lot of more drastic and make a new work about 20 minutes long. So what are the three parts that List doing? The first part was in D minor, and the melody comes from the second act Ghost Warning Don Juan and the final song where they met in the, the symmetry. And then the second part, there's a very famous aria, probably one of the most loving aria ever written. It's called Last Sea Ballet Don Juan. And where the Don Juan was trying to steal the Selena. And then the final piece, like the final part from the list Don Juan was the melody comes from an original opera called Son of Champagne. It's a very exciting piece. And List, of course, take every possibility to make the work showy. That's why this work become one of the hardest work ever written. There's a funny story. A famous composer, Scraven, hurt his hand while practicing this piece. So I know this story. I try not to practice too hard. I try to save my hand. So the maximum I can play this piece every day was one hour. Other than that, I can't do much with this piece. So it's a very difficult. Once you hear it, you know, it, this piece is almost include all the piano technique possible. There are thirds, sixth, ten, octaves, chords, everything. Basically, everything you can dream for becoming a pianist is included in this piece. So I don't know how many, how many of you actually played it before, or read it, read, at least read it, but I recommend you to start from the original version, and there you can look for Mussolini's version as well. <laughs> in another level. I'm not going to scare you with that today. So, why don't we take a listen for each of the excerpts and try if you can reflect on this while you listen to the later, the this piano version. Okay, I'm just going to play each excerpt very quickly. The first one is while they met in the Simish. The Don Juan invited the statue to the dinner. You see how scary it is, right? <laughs> Thank you. 
So you hear the scales going up and down, and that later becomes a double third in the Liszt's work. And that just kills every pianist whenever you get to that moment. Even if you're 100% ready, you still feel scared. So wish me luck, baby. <laughs> okay, and then we go to the very famous aria in the second part. And that list made in two variations. So this part, it actually takes the majority of the piece, probably about eight minutes long. Uh, the plot, some of you know it. Don Juan want to uh, seduce a Selena, and he distracts Selena's fiance, Marcelo, and try to pursue Selena, seduce her to accompany him to his castle. So there's many back and forth. It's a very beautiful duet go between Don Juan and Selena. So let's just take a listen of it very briefly. I know probably all of you have heard this already. I'm sorry, this is actually the third part. I think I skipped one part. Okay. same melody keep going to uh, repeat themselves so everybody knows this very well right and the last one was the song of champagne and this plot is the La Parano held a party for Don Juan to seduce more noble women and then Don Juan felt very proud of himself and it's uh, one of the the triumphant of the you know Don Juan's aria and so he's very happy of what he does I guess <laughs> You see that the tempo here is actually go way faster than a piano work because the piano work later goes all the octaves and all the chords and you can't really go this fast. So this is the paraphrase. You don't go exactly what happened in the original work, but really take the idea and later transcribe to his own work. So I want you to have something for you to think about it, especially um, when you hear the word like Don Juan fantasy by list, is that when you come to hear this music, you are not only going to hear what Mozart does in the opera, but to hear what Liszt does with Mozart's opera. So through this work, you are not only hear the greatness of Mozart, but actually hear 
the least powerful uh, personality through his work because this is a really a list Mozart. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the performance. It will be 18 minutes long. So let's get started. <laughs>
conferences and if something is really hard besides playing pieces like this is to talk about them and play. And the piano almost lasted too. So, <laughs> so thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming out.